Children and teenagers these days aren't going outside as much as before. 50 years ago, nearly half of all kids in America walked their bike to school. Today, it's less than 13%. This is largely due to the lack of independence children have. Parents are more worried than ever about letting their kids go out on their own, because look at all these kidnappers outside. Look at them. However, stranger kidnappings are astonishingly rare, and these cases are always sensationalized in the media. The real threat to the safety of children are cars. Vehicle collisions are the number one cause of death among children and teenagers, killing thousands and injuring tens of thousands every year. When you look at how our cities are designed, none of this is surprising. Modern suburbs, and especially American suburbs, are car dependent. Neighborhoods are endless mazes of single family homes with streets laid out in winding cul de sacs. Businesses sit behind giant parking lots with wide multi lane strodes full of high speed car traffic. This forces you to cross these big intersections designed for the flow of vehicles rather than the safety of people. This creates a vicious cycle where the dangerous streets make parents drive their kids more, but by doing so, they're adding more cars to the problem. Recently, the channel Oh The Urbanity made a video about Miami, and they caught this footage of a school bus having to stop in an angle and block traffic just so kids can safely get off. Because drivers literally would not stop. So when everything's too far away and crossing the street is too dangerous, children have zero independent mobility until they turn 16 and get a driver's license. Most of the world sets their legal driving age to 18 and for good reason. Teenage drivers are four times more likely to crash than adults, mainly due to immaturity and inexperience. But in most of North America, teenagers as young as 16 can drive unsupervised. And in some places, it's as young as 14. If we had viable alternatives to driving, our legal driving age wouldn't have to be so low, and teenagers wouldn't have to risk their lives just so they can have some independence. Until then, children have to rely on mommy and daddy to chauffeur them everywhere. This is where the soccer mom stereotype comes from, someone who spends all their time driving their kids to and from different activities. In car-dependent suburbia, dropping off or picking up kids from school becomes this massive ordeal, with cars backing up for miles of traffic. These schools may be far away and are sometimes in rural locations, but this is primarily due to sprawling car-centric design. Due to the low density of the suburbs, schools have to consolidate into fewer but larger facilities that are farther away, rather than having more smaller schools that are closer. Regardless, schools being in the rural places does not justify the lack of infrastructure. This beautiful video by Bicycle Dutch shows how majority of all children in the Netherlands bike themselves to school, even if it's miles away in a rural area. They can do this because they've built safe cycling infrastructure throughout all their cities and the entire country. We might not build bike lanes across the whole country like the Dutch, but even if a fraction of these kids were able to walk or bike to school, it would make a huge difference for both parents and the development of children. A 2002 psychology study asked elementary school students to draw a map of their path to school, and the results were just sad. The child who walked to school on their own produced this accurate detailed drawing with various landmarks along the way. The child who walked with an adult got the orientation wrong, but still roughly identified the right directions. But this is the drawing from the child who was driven to school. Studies in Switzerland from the 90s found that children who freely played in their neighborhood on their own spent twice as much time outside, were way more active, had more than twice as many friends, and had better motor and social skills compared to kids who played in a park under parental supervision. Without independent mobility, children don't get as much exercise, contributing to the major child obesity crisis in the US. It also prevents them from, you know, going out and socializing. Studies show that children with less independence are lonelier as they have a weaker sense of community, lower sense of safety, and have fewer activities with friends. The emptiness of car-dependent suburbia also makes it feel more dangerous. In Jane Jacobs' book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she explains the concept known as eyes on the street. It basically means that vibrant and lively streets feel safer as there are more people around and thus more eyes to deter bad behavior. This is why dark alleyways or streets at nighttime feel dangerous. But without people regularly walking by or casual onlookers watching the street, suburbia feels lonely and creepy. If a child were to be kidnapped outside, no one would notice. Over the past few decades, this sense of danger has changed our cultural attitudes towards children being out on their own, 
to the point where it can literally land you in jail. Like Nicole Ganey, who was arrested and charged with child neglect for letting her son walk to the park alone. Or Deborah Harrell, who spent 17 days in prison and temporarily lost custody of her child, all for letting her daughter play in the park alone while she was working at a nearby McDonald's. An even more ridiculous case was Jackie Kendrick, who got reported to Child Services for letting her two kids play in her own backyard while she watched from inside. Some schools in the US even have rules not allowing anyone to walk at all, so even if you are with your child, you might end up like Jim Howie from Tennessee, who got arrested for picking his kids up from school on foot instead of driving a car. Even if a child could walk or bike around on their own, Car-dependent suburbia is bland. There's almost nothing to do and nowhere to go apart from a park or the shopping mall. Additionally, our public spaces are actively designed specifically to keep kids away. An example of this are those metal studs that are placed on benches or railings to prevent skateboarding. Many malls, amusement parks, and even Chick-fil-A are flat-out banning teenagers from entering without parental supervision. When the streets are too dangerous and there aren't any places to hang out in, is it a surprise that kids these days want to stay at home all day, playing video games, and watching Skibbity Toilet? Social media apps like TikTok basically serve as online public spaces where people can share their voices in an open environment. However, this is just as problematic as Elon Musk saying that Twitter will be the digital town square. With the recent motions to ban TikTok in the US, there is a critical lack of true public spaces that are accessible to young people. Car dependency in North America is not an inevitable thing. Suburbia doesn't have to be built this way. It's possible to make our streets safer and encourage more outdoor activity by changing our infrastructure. This means narrowing streets, installing protected bike lanes, and adding traffic homing measures to slow down cars and prevent collisions. We also need to change our zoning laws to allow higher density houses and small businesses to be built in the suburbs so that people can live closer to amenities. These changes don't only benefit children. When a city is safe and comfortable enough for kids, then it's safe and comfortable for everyone. If you wouldn't let your child ride in this bike lane by themselves, then no one will because it's not designed properly, period. This is why in the few remaining walkable neighborhoods that do exist in North America, you will see lots of children walking to and from school all by themselves. This is also very common in East Asian cities, which they've achieved by having good public transit and dense urban development that creates eyes on the street. Not to mention the amount of pedestrian space you find, which provide attractive public spaces for teenagers to hang out. All of these things are completely possible to build in North America, but we just don't. Laws like zoning codes or parking requirements make it illegal to build anything other than car-dependent suburbs. We also continue to throw money at expensive road infrastructure, leaving almost nothing for pedestrian or transit projects. Car culture is so prevalent that many people simply believe that anything other than cars are inherently worse. Cause yeah, when you spend ludicrous amounts of money subsidizing highways and suburbs, of course driving is going to be the only option. So even when bike lanes or public transit projects are proposed, you get tons of excuses from NIMBYs about all the traffic it'll cause or where am I gonna park my car? These people really like to blame the problems that cars create on other modes of transportation. Is your city running out of money and on the verge of bankruptcy? Clearly it's because of all those bike lanes. Uh, don't, don't look at all those billions of dollars that we're about to spend on the highway. Th th that's not it. Most of these are policy issues, policies made by groups of old people sitting in a government building which are then followed by some other old people who call themselves planners and engineers. So to actually make changes and improve our cities, we need more civic engagement. Currently, most people who vote and attend city council meetings are at least 50 years old. The direction our cities are going in is being determined by a bunch of boomers. Cycling is an important mode of transportation. You know, it helps us reduce greenhouse gas emissions. It improves our health. But I think Gen Z and even sometimes millennials are underrepresented in this issue. I truly believe that younger people want more watchable cities and we have the power to make it a reality. This is partly why I started making these videos in the first place. Our cities have a huge impact on younger people and we deserve to have a say on how they're built. 
even if you're not a professional planner or don't know what exclusionary zoning means. It's time to stop making excuses for our bad urban design and ask ourselves, do we want our cities to prioritize moving as much cars as possible, or do we want to actually prioritize people?